Okay, we only we have two guys, Paul and John. Yeah. You always have to leave early, so I don't know if you have to leave early today. Um, but I do want to like get your perspectives for as guys with disabilities. <laughs> what is your perspective with dating? Um, well, I've been dating off and on since about 15. And mainly when I first started, I dated a mixture of disabled and able-bodied. Um, and it wasn't until probably about, oh, I'd say my first relationship in high school where I really felt like, for a while there, I really felt like I was more drawn to somebody without a disability because there for a while I didn't I I felt like for a while I labeled myself as not disabled even though yes I am in a chair mm -hmm. but for a while there even I would say probably my entire high school career I was I labeled myself as non-disabled even though yes I am in a chair yes I have this I yes I have but I don't, I didn't let it seem, or I didn't let my disability show through. You know, I didn't go through, you know, what, or that four year period with a sign on my head that said, oh, look at me, I'm disabled. No, I didn't. I went about my day to day life and did not let my disability stop me from achieving my dreams. But mm -hmm. in, a in a sense, it didn't, it didn't stop me from dating until. I took a good look and said, maybe I should, you know, kind of be with somebody who can, you know, experience or can, you know, gather from my experience. So fast forward, you know, a couple of years, I was in a couple of relationships, they fizzled out, and six months is when it really set for me that I am, that I should you know, be with somebody who can be, you know, who can understand my, in, you know, my situation. And that's why I got with Tylea because she understood my situation. She still understands my situation six months later. And that's the kind of person that I want in my life is somebody that can understand where I'm coming from mm -hmm. and somebody that doesn't look down on me for talking about my disability the way I do. Because, like I said, I have a YouTube channel. Obviously, you probably can see the logo behind me. But um, I, I try to put myself into a positive nature of, hey, this is me. I have a disability. If you don't like it, get out. And that's not what Tylea does. Tylea looks at me for my disability and says, I don't care if you have a disability. I'm going to be with you for the long haul. And that's what I love about her. Woohoo! Well, and that's, you know, that's interesting as well as like able-bodied versus disabled, um, you know, what are, do we have preferences um, or does it not matter? Um, hold, hold on real quick, Tylea. Um, I wanted to recognize hmm, Paul's uh, from the chat. He said, well, I'm so old. I come from a different era. And I said, I feel ya. And Priya said, me too. And Paul says, I was discouraged to pursue romantic relationships. So, um, like Tylee, I do want to give Tylee an opportunity to respond to John, but I also would like Paul as the other guy here. Um, if you don't mind, Paul, if you'd like to, um, let me know if you want to share, like, why you felt discouraged to pursue romantic relationships. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think he's typing. Mm -hmm. Or are you? Is it okay if I say something while he's typing, or is that rude? I don't know what. If that's rude, he said okay. He said okay. I think. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. You're so nice. I also think like the, the difference between men and women in society. Like we still have those, those whatever roles where a man needs to be a certain way 
I mean, and um, not for me, like Robert, Robert, like by 90 pounds when I met him, you know, he wasn't like this big muscular man, you know, he was just, I was drawn to him because of his creativity and his humor. So, but I think in mainstream society, there's this role that men play and a role that women play. And if you don't fit into that role, being disabled, even, I don't know, I feel like it, that role is even more diminished as a man than as a woman, because in society, men are like, I will take care of this woman type of thing. And I've been hit on in wheelchairs, like all these like rolling down the men will be like, hey, what's up? And I'm like, whatever, get away from me. But I'm always like thinking, I wonder what's up with these guys that are going to like, you know, what's, you know, their deal. I never really get into conversations with them, but. But I think those roles also play into what the difference, whether you're disabled or non-disabled, it does play into it. And I don't know if Paul's done yet. Paul's waiting for me because I talk a lot. Sorry, Paul. No, you're fine. Let just okay. He said I asked two girls in high school out on dates, and they said no. And I and you know while you're typing paul um i'm i'm curious john did you feel in high school i mean i feel like like i went to an all-girl high school but prior to that i went to regular public school there was a reason i went to an all-girl high school because i just felt like there was so much other pressure so it sounds like you went to a co-ed mm -hmm. either public i don't know if it's public or private school but um in high school john did you feel like that your disability prevented you from, or prevented other uh, girls that you liked from seeing you in that way? Yes, actually, um, you're very, you're, you're right on that. I went to a public high school and other, like I would pursue, you know, and talk to people, you know, just trying to get myself out there. But, um, you know, I think mostly people looked at me for one of three reasons. One, because of obviously the disability. They were afraid of that probably. Two, it was probably the way I dressed. And three, the way that I presented myself, especially the last two years. I was, you know, very well known in the Student Government Association with the television production team and as well as a few other organizations through the high school. And I believe most, if not all of them, looked at me as if I'm intimidative because they, you know, saw me as, you know, oh, he's the morning news guy. He's this, he's that. He's the guy that wears the bow tie that sits on the morning news. And they look at me and they say, well, you have all these qualities, but right now I'm not looking for this or I'm not looking for that or I'm not wanting to do this because of, you know. I've had people that literally will come up to me and say, I don't know why people would date you because you're disabled. Like, you would not, they don't know why they would date you if you were disabled? They, they, they Same say, here. I don't know who the heck would date you because you have a disability. Nobody likes someone with a disability. I'm like, you could have set my head on fire. <laughs> like, are you kidding me? That, that makes me mad because, you know, there's so many qualities to a, dis a person with a disability such as mine. And other people that need to- that to your face? They, yeah. They, a couple of people, yes, said that That's to my- horrible. Face. Like, what really boils my blood is the fact that someone will sit there and stoop down to your level and say, no one's going to date you because you're disabled. Get out of here. I'm like, okay, well, kudos to you. You just pissed me off. Oh my gosh. Well, and, and you know, Paul said in the chat, they said, he said that they said I should be castrated because I was a handicapped freak. Um, so, oh my God. Yeah. So yeah, I, I know Jessica wants to talk and I know. T I have a lot I want to say. Okay, so I have a lot. Okay, <laughs> hold on. I think Priya was saying, Priya, you're on mute. Uh, Priya, you're on mute. All of the '70s, where I think people, well, Robert and I were talking about this because I did an interview with Paul, and I was like discussing it with Robert, and he's like, "Yeah, the '70s and '80s, people still use the." Cripple, called people crippled and did stuff like that. It wasn't sure. really till the 90s that that politically correctness about everything. 
You know what, though? I don't know if that's true. I actually interviewed on Chair Chats a woman by the name of Angela Carr. And I think when she was a teenager, they were encouraging her to get all of her stuff taken out so she would not be able to have babies at 15. Um, and so, and I think that was like the 80s right. or 90s. She's like my age. So I think it was the 90s. Why, why, did, why, did, why did they do that? Isn't that against the law? Well, it's still her someone... choice, but it was recommended for her to not be able to reproduce. So um, it was interesting. But okay, I'm gonna let go. I'm gonna go Tylea, then Jessica. Okay. So my story, it's pretty sad. My first crush I had, it was a sixth grader. I'm just gonna call him Benjamin for the sake of this video. That's not his real name. And me and him <laughs> got me and Benjamin got extremely close, and I got the courage to tell Ben that I liked him in front of the whole school. He looks down upon me with his gray eyes. I never forget this, guys. He looks down upon me. He looks at the chair. He looks at my buck teeth. He's like, well, nobody's going to date you because you're fat, you're ugly, you're in a wheelchair, and you look like a effing gorilla. What an asshole. He said that in front of everyone? In front of the whole gym. In front of the whole gym. So me and John's story is very similar when he, he said that. Wow. There. And for he a while. Have guts. I'm sorry. And, and, and he apologized to me in high school. But for a while there, I had very low wow. self-esteem. I had very low self-esteem. That, that takes guts. I'm sorry. <laughs> I had very low self-esteem for a while because I was going through a transition to where I had buck teeth. Like, if you look at my middle school teacher, uh, if you look at my middle school teacher uh, pictures, I had buck teeth and I, I wasn't confident in myself at all. Then I went through the transition where I got braces. Well, in the seventh grade, my love life, per se, got a little bit better when I met a young boy with, with autism in my class. We were into Elvis, so we bonded and we started quote-unquote dating. In fact, he asked me out on Yahoo Messenger. So that's to tell you how old I am. So me and him started dating, but his mother oh, didn't didn't agree with the fact that her son was with me because I was in a cheer. And then we dated all throughout my sophomore year of high school. Then Valentine's Day 2012, I uh, decided to send him a package in the mail with gifts that I had saved up my money for. So I put this package together. I sent it two weeks before Valentine's Day so he had it. Mind you, he lived across the street, but I was never allowed to go see him. I'm sorry if I get emotional, but on Valentine's Day, I come back from physical therapy. There's a package on my front door. My mom says it's from him. We open it with excitement. Guess what's in there? All the stuff I got him for Valentine's Day with a note. A nasty note telling you to stay away from her son. And that I, I can never speak to him again. Had to go to the police because the family went nuts. That shut me down for a long time. Like a very long time. Then I meet this guy on Facebook. I'm not going to say his na name on here. Thought he was from Kentucky. Thought everything was going to be fine. Everything was going to be okay. I helped him out financially, medically. And turns out... After I told him I was diagnosed with adjustment disorder and mental health, he's gone. Meet, a, meet another guy on Facebook, same situation, but once my great grandmother died, he disconnected from me completely. He cheated on me with his ex girlfriend that lived in the same state locally and lied about it. And at that time, I'm, I started connecting with this guy in the corner. And John was just, like, John was just a friend in the beginning, y'all. But he was there for me when my great-grandmother died. He 
pushed me forward and we bonded and we talked about what we wanted and that's the story and what I realized I loved John was when it was it was one night we were sitting there listening to Elvis and he showed me pictures of his childhood and I'm just like dang he he's the one like just dang it you know and I, we went tonight to I went tonight to shine and I was thinking <laughs> thinking about John the whole night. I wasn't thinking about my boyfriend at the time. So yeah, that's that's my story, how I got to John, and I'm forever grateful for him. He's my best friend and my right of die, and hopefully one day we'll get married. So and his mother Susan loved me and I loved her, so let me uh pardon oh, me. Um, she, uh, she met her, I was there when her great grandmother died. Um, her great grandmother died about two weeks before my mother. And, um, like I said, she, I was there and I helped her through it. And then come to find out two weeks later, she had to do the same exact damn thing for me. And, um, you know, you never you never know when you're going to find somebody that's going to be like that for you. And then just to up and find it and know that that person is going to be there for you and help you through it. It's just like that sealed the deal for me. That, that honestly sealed the deal for me because I knew right then and there, this chick's not, this, this chick's going to be my ride or die. I, I, I'm not ashamed to say it. You are my ride or die, Tylea. And I know. I, <laughs> It's obvious when you wake me up at 6.30 in the morning. <laughs> Good I mean, you. Honestly, you do not know how much trouble you've kept me out of over the last six months. <laughs> He'll be like, Good morning! I'm like, Good morning, John. Well, I'm... And I, you know, just from hearing these stories, Paul's, Tylea's, and John's stories, um... I almost feel like having a disability and trying to find a relationship frames relationships in a different way because I think when you don't have a disability or you just fit in so well to everybody, you know, the you know majority of people, then you're kind of like going off of these superficial reasons of why you want to be with someone, whereas disability kind of drops all that superficial stuff because you're not the cutest whatever you're not like this like dick and jane character or whatever you people and then act about real things not like oh she's really gorgeous and blonde or whatever the you know i'm, I'm just thinking of things you see in movies and stuff you know just like oh he's the hot guy he's the popular guy he's on the football team I really want to be with him where it's more like I want to be with this person because they understand what I'm going through and I understand what we're going through and we're friends we're friends before we're you know in, in a relate and I think that's really important like Robert and I are like like friends like really we're like each other's best friends essentially so and you know I tell John like we'll be like I tell John and Taylor because you know they like go oh, because I'm old and they're all like Priya <laughs> and I'm like oh my god you should see me and Robert we're like screaming and yelling at each other and being like blah 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 and then we're like okay so what are we gonna have for dinner like it's literally true. I I an hour later, like the next sentence is, we're like, blah, 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 blah. I'm like, all right, so what's your exactly. <laughs> I know. You know that, that's what I mean, John. Really, the relationship looks like, in my opinion. So, yeah, I think everybody's lovers. You know, the struggle is there. Eventually, I think there is going to be a person that sees through all of that stuff and is will, will want to be with you for the person that you are. Absolutely, and that's I really believe that will happen for people. So, yeah. mm -hmm. I agree. Okay, I'm going to let Jessica speak because she's been so patient. I know. I'm sorry, Jessica. Go on. <laughs> it's okay. I mean, yeah, I'm patient with you guys, but. In general, I have like zero patience right now. 
<laughs> just with not having any electricity and this, that, and the other. But I understand. Um, so please, thank you for showing such patience in your situation. Go for it. You guys are the exception. So feel special today because this weekend has been a total shit storm. <laughs> um, anyway, for those of you that are new that don't know, um, I am a left pony amputee. I lost it the two years. I guess it's two years and eight months ago. Wow. Um, and so, you know, I've, I've been able-bodied my whole life up to that point. And I, I can kind of relate to, you know, what John and Ty Leah went through in high school. I mean, yeah, I may have, I've never had a disability, but, you know, I was bullied really bad and picked on and all that and treated like crap. And um, so I get that part and I totally understand. Um, but, you know, fast forward to my adult years and um, it wasn't really too hard to find anybody. Um, but I, I learned the lesson, you know, don't go looking because, you, you know, it'll, it'll come when you least expect it. And that is that is so true sometimes. Um, but, you know, after the amputation and struggling for quite some time about, you know, my physical appearance, because, I mean, who wants to be with somebody who's missing a limb? Like, that's how I felt about it. Like, what man's going to want me now? And I eventually got to the point where, you know what, if, if I don't jump back into that scene, I'm never going to do it. So it's like, you know, jumping up, jumping into the deep end all at once instead of testing the water. And I've had, you know, I've had successes, I've had failures and um, the relationships I've been in since then have not worked out. Um, I've been rejected because I've been in, because I am an amputee. And, you know, I think I'm, I'm starting to, one thing I'm starting to realize is, you know, exactly what John said. It, it's, having somebody that's like physically like you in that sense whether you know you're in a chair or you're missing a limb they get it they get the daily struggle they get you know having a routine just to get out of bed you can't just jump out of bed anymore you gotta you know sit on the side of the bed and put your prosthetic on and then you can get out of bed and pray to god you don't pee your pants <laughs> which honestly has happened to me <laughs> but um I, every I think, huh? <laughs> I pee on myself. I pee on myself every morning, Jessica, just to let you know. Oh, shit. The struggle's exactly. real, man. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I mean, sorry, I poo. I poo. <laughs> I poo on myself sometimes hey, too. Um, Not as yeah, much as I, poo. I just, I, I think that I would probably be better suited with somebody that's like me. Um, I've never really thought about it. I've never, I've never really come across anybody who's had any form of disability whatsoever throughout my life, you know, except when I was younger, my grandfather was in a wheelchair because he had a stroke. You know, that's really the only time where I had somebody in my life that had a disability. And then, you know, my mom had her stroke, but then she wasn't, she was never wheelchair bound. She can walk and talk and everything, but, you know, seeing her struggle and, you know, just trying to do everyday activities when you lose that, like half of your core, you know, your fine motor skills and coordination. And, um, I, I, I got it. And then it happened to me and, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm now single. I have been, um, I've tried, <laughs> I've put myself out there, you know, and then things just don't work out. I start talking to somebody and it just doesn't work out and blah, 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 blah. Um, but I'll t and at the same time, I, like with how my, my disability is and how I physically struggle with it, you know, because I'm in a lot of pain a lot of the time. Sometimes I think maybe I am better off with an able-bodied person that can do these things for me that I can't do, you know. So it's just, it's kind of like, it, it's 
damned if you do, damned if you don't kind of thing where, you know, you're just, I'm conflicted. So does that, does that, um, and I, I do want to give, Imani put in the chat, she said she had, a, she felt like she had to fight for acceptance. And I, and I want to dig into that too, Imani, but um, a question for you, Jessica. So do you, oh, or for everybody, do we feel like we look at dating as more strategic then? Like, oh, I'm going to date these people because like they can help me or I'm going to date these people because they can get, they get me. Like, does it make dating not, I'm going to fall in love, allow myself to fall in love with whoever comes into my space and be open to that? Or, or do we get stuck on like one specific profile? Talia? I get, I'll, oh, sorry. I'll go ahead, Jess. You can go ahead first. I was going to say, I guess it's kind of like a mixture of both. Um, Cause I mean, I'm, I'm always straightforward and honest with, with, with my brought, Hey, you know, I am a left below knee amputee. I have mental illness, a lot, you know, that, that ties into that. Um, and that's a big deal because I never know when I'm going to like have a trigger and have a PTSD episode. It can happen anytime. And so I'm always upfront and honest, and um, if they're okay with it, fine. If they're not, whatever. Fuck you. <laughs> like, you're a dick. I don't need you in my life anyway. Um, but I, yeah, I, I guess I, I'd say that it's kind of like a mixture of both. I mean, and that's not to say that I'm, like, prejudiced in any way um, of somebody who's in a wheelchair. Um, but at the same time, like, I need, like, I need help too. Like my life's a daily struggle just to get things done. And, you know, having somebody that can do these things for me, you know, it, it would just be like a huge weight lifted off of me where I don't have to worry about this. And I don't have to worry about that. I don't have to struggle with this. And I don't have to fight with this. And, you know, I don't have to take breaks and I don't, you know, I'm not going to be in pain the next day. And, um, so, I mean, yeah, that, that's, that's part of it. Um. Mm -hmm. I totally understand what you're saying, Jessica, because after I had my injury, I was already with Robert before I had it. And, you know, we were, we were in a band together. We just were part of this music art scene. So that was just kind of our, whatever our position in life at that time. And, you know, when I had my injury, he, you know, he just decided he wanted to stay with me. Now I try to imagine my life, what it would be, you know, I'm so great, even though Robert and I fight about things and he has really bad ADD and he's like super unorganized. So he's always leaving things and it gets caught in my wheelchair. And I'm like, do you know, I use a wheelchair has, has it, have, do you understand that? Like I'll say things like that to him, but I also know it's part of his mental Make a, I don't want to call it an illness, but because it's like he does, he succeeds in life, but he has a lot of obstacles to overcome to succeed in life. And, you know, so because he's like trying to keep his mind together to work and, you know, make sure that I have food and things are there for me, all that's like a lot on him as a person with his mind. So I totally understand you know, I forgive because of that, but I also get irritated at the same time. But then I like think, God, I wouldn't be able to do, you know, I just took this video footage of me going to this inaccessible art gallery that I have a show in. And uh, I just really want my friend to document because I can't, it's me and Robert together that I'm allowed, I'm able to do all the things I do. It's not just me. And I want people that to be very clear that, I have a person that helps me out and is willing to help. Me out. And I help him too, you know, like I pay the bills and remind him like, you have this meeting on this day, please use an organizer. But since you don't, I will tell you. <laughs> yeah. Hi, Leah, you wanted to say something too? I forgot what the question was. Oh, I, was I was just asking, do, do we, is there 
do we feel like we're more strategic about our dating as people with disabilities? Because, you know, with someone with a disability, we feel like they get it. And with someone who's able-bodied, we feel like, oh, at least our, they can be play the caregiver role too. You want me to be honest? I prefer to be with somebody disabled. Okay. Yeah. Because then I don't have to like explain to the person what I'm going through. And it's just easier for me to connect with the person. See, I, I'm different because I'm open to dating both. But if I was to date someone that's uh, disabled, I don't want it to be portrayed, oh, y'all should get together because y'all are both disabled. Yeah, that's the same problem, too. Like, if I'm yeah. with somebody disabled, he has to compliment me, too, and he has to help me, like, become a better person, too. Right. You know, it's like stick with your kind, right? Or, yeah. like mentioned. Oh, the worst thing I hate in life is when people are like, Oh, hey, I know this disabled person. You guys should be friends. And then, yeah, yeah, that's that's exactly what I mean. <laughs> oh, you so, you know, it's, are, are you saying something, Paul? I see you moving your room. Is he typing something? Let's see. If you want to try to talk and we could get used to, to get used to your CP accent. No? Okay. No worries. And I think, too, I think that's the dilemma, too, because I've had that issue in high school and middle school. There was this boy that liked me that had CP, but he couldn't use a commu He couldn't talk, and his family was very rude. So it's not that he couldn't talk. It was just the way his family was and the fact that I just wasn't into him because he just had a negative outlook on his disability and he didn't embrace it at the time and he still doesn't. Mm. So. So, Paul, well, I'm just going to say what Paul said. He said, I stopped being picky. I'm running out of one day, LOL. <laughs> we totally get, of course. I mean, I think about that not so much with relationships, but just like getting things done, making my art and, doing this activism and all this stuff. I'm like, I got, I can't worry about all this other stuff. I have to get this done because, you know, I'm 53 years old. I'm not like in my twenties and I don't know. I think when you get to 50, you're kind of like, okay, like don't have that much time left. So let's get this shit going. Um, uh, yeah. So I, I've heard that forever. 56, Paul said, and, and yeah. Paul, I mean, <laughs> I Oldest one here. Yeah. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> Paul, you take it. <laughs> I have a here. What John? I didn't hear you. Oh, I didn't hear that, John. What'd you say? I said only by about three years, but it's nothing. Age is just a number. <laughs> nothing. Three years. My brother's like three. Yeah, and a half. John, but there's a limit, man. There's a limit. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you can't date somebody 50 and be older than me or younger than me. So. <laughs> well, that's no, I'm, older than you by, I'm younger than you by three years. Well, age is another <laughs> thing. <laughs> you know, oh, Paul, Paul wants to say something. Oh, yeah, go ahead, Paul. <laughs> you don't know. What are you taking the bed with? It's a M over to So I'm Hang on. Okay. Hello. Pete, hi, nice to see you again. Hi, hi Pete. Hey, hello. I barely keep in You can barely do what? You can barely get in bed at night. I feel still old. You feel so old. I guess. Yeah. That stiffness, uh, you know, just. It's not just the number. It's real. He says age is not just a number, it's real. <laughs> no, I, I feel you, Paul. I'm all like, oh my God, 
three years old, besides my spasticity, I'm also like, <laughs> body just gets tied anyway. You can't like jump out of bed like you were when you were a teenager or something. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, age with disability is a, another, uh, maybe topic. that's a topic to talk about in the future because Absolutely. that is a oh. Absolutely. I wanted to, like, while Pete, while Pete is there, um, I wanted to see if Paul had any other, anything you wanted to say in regards to dating from the man's perspective. I think uh, Priya read his three-part series uh, on what he has done. In, in this series, and if I he wants to share that to the group, he would I be okay. Share. <laughs> He's saying, yeah, should we, I? Okay, so Paul, I Paul sent me a blog. It's a three-part series on human touch, and you know I read it a couple of days ago. So I'm just gonna try. I'm this is from memory. I'm remembering it, but basically, um, I really love what he wrote in his blog because he's talking about two things that people feel really uncomfortable with, which is his ability not to communicate, like you know, the majority of people and sex. And he talked about how he was in high school. We read, he wrote about how he was treated by women and that kind of, you know, he, you know, high school was out for him. And then when he got older, he, you know, he said he would like see like, you know, couples in high school and he'd want that, but you know, they're like slapping each other on the butt and doing these things. And he actually mentions that that's actually a relief, like that's actually a human release being slapped on the ass, I guess, which I learned from you all, so thank you. And like, I was like, oh, I guess people do it for a reason without knowing. So then, you know, in his journey to get human contact, um, he re he goes to Vegas one year, so he researched finding a prostitute to have human contact with. And the place he went to that he found and researched, they actually dealt with, the, he realized they probably dealt with a lot of disabled people because there was a lot of disabled parking there. And that the woman That's that- awesome. The woman he was with was really, gent you know, worked with him, under you know, understood what was going on. And and I guess you try to do this once a year. I, I can't remember. Yeah. Way to go, Paul. Way to go. <laughs> I like that because we talk about you know, this idea of going to see if you, you're in this position where whether you're like not the beautiful person and or like you're disabled and can't have sex, it is an important part of life and we should be embarrassed to go to prostitutes and like this. And this is like like sex workers are an important, valuable thing in our society and you know mm -hmm. that, that I kind agree. of <laughs> yeah, and plus he goes where it's legal and, you know, everything is regulated and, you know, the safest circumstances for that, you know. Yeah, yeah, that's why I said he did research, but that's good you added that because, yeah, he did, he went to Las Vegas because it's, it's legal in, in Las Vegas. <laughs> yeah, certain counties, not actually in Vegas, but, you know, there are small towns where around have, yeah a certain county you know so but anyways it is safer in that um well when it, um, when it's legal it is and the prostitutes are held up to a standard of yeah what with and what what diseases they're gonna pass on to you <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, they have protocols and things that they do. Yeah, that's what I mean. Safe, yeah. Important aspect of that. I yeah. 
Yes, Talia? I'm just going to say this. I'm glad somebody brought up the topic of sex um, in this chat because I feel like that's an important part of being an adult with a disability. Like, I didn't start getting, like, orgasms till I was 18 years old. And I became curious about sex and everything. And it, it, it's okay to be curious. Like, I did the wheelchair porn thing for a while. I would watch that and go on YouTube. There is wheelchair porn. And, um... <laughs> there I didn't is. know that was a thing. <laughs> yeah, and there's, the like... And, yeah, there is... And I got caught watching it, and my dad comes in, he's like, Ty, what are you watching? <laughs> I just got so embarrassed about it. And then they had a, my parents had to talk with me, like, it's okay that you're going through this. You're 18 years old, so whenever I need, like, something to, like, relieve me from that, I always call John now, but before, when I was single, it was harder. <laughs> and that was talked about in his piece, like, how, you know, when his nervousness, his, his DP, uh, I don't know, what do you they side effects, but it gets worse, like the spasticity and all that stuff. Yeah, and, and, and the the woman he was with actually like helped him relax, and he was able to relax. It, it does relax you. You ain't lying, Paul. I get the same way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I'm right there with you. I'm so glad you brought that up. But I will talk about having a spinal cord injury and having sex is not like that for me because I have nerve damage in these areas. So like <clears throat> getting sensitivity aroused actually increases my pain. So it's like a really, it's really hard for me to have sex. And you know, that's another aspect of my relationship because- You should write about that. Oh yeah, I don't know. I'm I'm too like I'm too prudish about things like that. But I mean, I think it would be educational and beneficial for you. Internet, so that's fine. But yeah, no, um, yeah, you know, so that's like a difficult thing to know with a relationship where Robert is like physically able, you know, abled and. So that's, you know, that's something we get into fights about because, you know, I'm just like, I don't feel good. And he understands, but, you know, we still try to do what we can and figure that out. And then I've actually seen some posts on Instagram with women who have had spinal in, uh, injuries and they get this, I think it's called auto, auto dyslexic, I forget what it is. But auto dyslexia. Like, yeah, so... When you have a higher level of spinal cord injury, your body, it can actually kill you. Like, it's like this, your body, like, freezes up. And so some people with spinal cord injuries, too, have sex. They have to, like, they have to, like, you know, like, they have to, like, be really aware of what their body is doing because it could lead to something that could be detrimental to them in the end. So so that's, like, I don't know. I'm just reading what other people have spinal cord injuries said because I don't have that. I My injury is low. It's a T12 L1, which is, like, right near where the tailbone is. And this woman that I was reading about, she had a higher injury, like, I think, maybe more up towards her neck or something. Yeah, it happens for guys too. Um, uh, there is actually, I did the interview with uh, Cole and Charisma. They're an interabled and interracial couple. Uh, and it was, it was uh, I got to see them at the Reeve Summit. So they try to keep their YouTube channel more PG, um, family friendly, um, but they do have, uh, when I saw them at the Reef Summit, there they were actually able to speak more about. Um, oh, did we lose Tylea and? Oh, ah, we lost them. Okay, uh, they they wrote in the chat. They had to okay, go. so but yeah, they and so the first time they had sex that happened, and he had no idea what was happening. 
And so it was really interesting. And I've heard from a lot of people who become paralyzed when they go through rehab, that's something they don't talk to you about, you know, when they let you leave as part of your rehab. Well, I think I know Cole and Charisma because John actually, because I was looking for, I'm trying to do this documentary about ability. So I was like trying to find, I realized like, I don't know anyone with spinal cord injury. I know all these people with CP and MS and all these different things. But um, he, uh, he's like, oh, the colon charisma, like he went to Shepherd, And Shepherd actually talks about that. Like it's a spinal cord rehab center and they say you can have sex you can have children they actually do discuss that but i think that's because when you're fortunate enough to go to a place like shepherd clinic when you have a spinal cord injury they they're really like i okay well tylee is not here so i'm gonna say it i called it cripple camp i was like i went to cripple camp and this is what they taught me to do <laughs> <laughs> taught me all about all of that in the cripple camp which is shepherd center sorry shepherd center <laughs> great facility so i hate to like even say anything negative about that yeah. so but but that was one of the things i i just was really grateful i went there because they were just like this is how you transfer this is how you take a shower this is how you put on clothes this is how you brush your teeth this is how you manage your bowel, bowel program, you know, and all these different, you know, they really informed you like probably too much about what you had to watch out for. But in the end, it was a good thing for me because, you know, I learned about all that stuff. So, yeah, I just want to, I could have a, well, I can't now I'm 53, but when I was 29, I could have had a baby, but I didn't want to have children. So because then people are always like oh you couldn't have children i was like no i could have i just decided not to and i think that's an important thing for people to be like no i made the decision not to have children i could have if i wanted to so yeah because other people don't realize is that when you're disabled you can't have children yeah yeah um so. I, I want to ask Imani why Imani hasn't had a chance to speak and she put in the chat that she had a fight for acceptance. Uh, is that fight for acceptance from the perspective of dating or just in general society? Oh, I think you're mute. Oh, no, you're not muted. But I can't hear you. Are you talking softly, Imani? She talks soft. <laughs> What's going on? I can't hear you. I can't. He we can't hear you. Maybe try unplugging and plugging back in your earphones and mic. But that, well, while she's doing that, there are actually quite a few. It's like a trending thing now: interabled couples, where but it's mostly women with men, women able-bodied, men disabled. So it's really interesting to see how that that's trending. Okay, Imani, are you there? You want to test it? Well, I'm the opposite, so I don't fit into that trend. Me, me neither. Me neither. <laughs> Which I think that it would be nice to see more women, dis disabled women and men, but it's almost like, and that's what I was wondering. That's why I wanted to do this topic because I was wondering, oh, women as natural nurturers. Are they more open to dating someone with a disability, man with a disability, versus a man? Like men aren't usually seen as the disabled. I mean, I, I mean, men is not usually seen as the caregiving type, the nurturers. So they just want the woman to serve them, and they want this jewel on their hands, right? So it's like I was wondering if to see if there was um, what other people's thoughts and experiences were. All right, Imani, can you test yourself? No, we still can't hear you. You should leave and come oh. back in. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Are you trying to say something again? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Woo! <laughs> um, all out through high school, I felt like I needed a fight. I felt like I needed a fight for acceptance just to be accepted by somebody. Mm. And, yeah. So. As a 
No, or friends, or just romantically? Just, just, just oh, well, I had friends, but just uh, I think romantically, mm-hmm. and then right. right, yeah. So I <laughs> felt like I had had to prove who I am or explain my disability. So right. How have you dated anybody? I, I'm not really. I mean, I've had crutches, but not really dated anybody. Yeah. And are you, um, do you have a preference? Like, are you, do you look for men I, or? Um, look for men. Yes. Yeah. And I'm, op- I'm open to dating someone with a disability or without a disability, but mm-hmm. someone, uh, with that doesn't have a disability I don't want it to turn into like a solely a caregiver relationship to the point where there is no relationship absolutely I was talking with um she was Miss Wheelchair America a few years ago and she and her family came out to Hawaii and we got her some speaking gigs and some publicity out here and her husband and her her daughter came out with us I mean with her And so while she and I were doing the whole speaking thing, um, our husbands hung out with our kids. And I was so grateful because her husband told my husband that there's no way that they would ever do a relationship without the caregiver there. Like they're very careful about crossing that line. Like he'll help her with stuff if he has to, but like they're... It's very clear. And I was so grateful for that because I, I felt like I needed to have that conversation with my husband because I felt like that was weighing on our relationship, having the caregiving role there um, for both of us. Like he, you know, he was feeling burnt out and I was feeling like I'm being, like I was a burden. And so it wasn't good for either of us to feel that. Right. Um, and so I, I, I did want to hire somebody, but I didn't want to make him feel like he couldn't handle and that's why I had to hire someone. So I was really grateful for another husband to speak to him about his perspective. And he totally came around to it. Thank God, because um, then it helped us approach that conversation a lot easier, but it's. Yeah. I wrote this piece about, because like when we lived in California, they pay, they pay for like, I think they paid for 90 hours of caregiving and Robert ended up being the caregiver. So it it just allowed Robert not to have a job and to help me out with things. But now that we're in North Carolina, they don't, you have to be bedridden to get a caregiver. Like Mm. not, it's just horrible. Like, I'm like, what? Like, like anyone that has a caregiver, it's out of pocket in North Carolina. And I, you know, I, I, he has insomnia and stuff like that. So it's just like, I want to get up at five o'clock in the morning and get ready to go so I can be ready by at least noon to go do things. But, you know, if his insomnia, then it's like later. And, and you know, so I wrote this piece. It's like, well, if I could just need a caregiver for one hour a day, it would cost $15 to get out of bed. And that's like what I wrote. So yeah, I mean, that's one of the things I have a issue with is Medicaid doesn't, in North Carolina, doesn't really pay for caregiving services. And that's, I, you know, you need it. Yeah. So, well, we make too much money. So we would pay out, we were paying out of pocket, but then COVID hit and all our income dried up. So we had to stop. So I had to kind of regress to not having caregivers. Right. right. The, the, like, it was okay for a while, but then now I could see the pressure for both of us starting to weigh. Um, So yeah, like COVID needs to stop and we need to get back to work (laughs) because we don't have a choice, but it's, yeah, it's this, this delicate balance because as our partners, they want to be there and we want to be, feel like we're taken care of by them. But at the same time, we want to maintain our independence. Um, Right. And I want to be able to say, no, I want my hair like this and not feel bad about it. Right. Um, right. And so, or you, when I'm doing things, Robert's like, do you want help? I'm like, no, leave me alone. I'm doing it myself. Get away. <laughs> yeah. Right. So, yeah. Jessica, did you have something to say? It takes a lot of navigation. Yeah. Uh, I think that that kind of weighs on my mind. Like when it comes to dating too, 
the whole burden thing. Like, I don't want to feel like I'm a burden on the man I'm with, you know, because I need help with things that I never used to need help with before. And I still struggle with it. I still get frustrated. I'm still angry. I'm even a little bit bitter about it. You know, I, I was a hardworking person. I was an independent woman and I didn't rely on nobody for anything. And now I'm a codependent person and I hate it. And, but there, it's the, at the same time, it's like, what am I supposed to do? There's nothing I can do about that. You know, I can't, I can't change the fact that I don't have a leg. I mean, believe me, if I could go, if I was able to use a time machine and go back in time and, you know, tell these, tell these idiotic doctors that, Hey, this is the problem. This is what's going on. And this is what's going to happen. You know, God, of course I'd do it. I think, you know, all of us would, if, you know, like Priya, I'm, I'm sure you get, I'm sure you feel like that once in a while where you could just go back in time and make sure that this doesn't happen. But, you know, it is what it is. And I just, I don't, I, I worry about putting pressure on the man I'm with because I, I it can be, it, it, it's stressful. It can be stressful. Yeah. And I don't want to feel like I'm not really worth anything in the relationship. Mm -hmm. I worry about that too. I don't want to feel like a burden in a relationship. Well, Jessica, I will share something with you because I, like my, you got in a car accident. Is that what happened with you? A car? No, um, I had a blood clot in the artery behind my okay. left knee. Okay, so mine was an accident. I was walking on a skate lift and a skate ramp and I fell down. And I had the type of mother that like really was like, what if you had done this? What if, so I always fought against that thought frame. So like for me, I, I never think in those terms, like if I could go back, I would do this. You know, I would make sure that, cause I just think things happen and it's life and there's, there's no, you know, I don't know. I don't think that way, but at the same time, I was like a very independent woman. I was, you know, like as far as me and Robert, because of Robert's mental issues, I was like the more together one. I was like, okay, I'm taking care of this, move to the side, let me take care of this. Little. But I can't do that anymore. And Robert needs to be more involved. And so, yeah, that, that was a big difference. And it's, yeah, it's really, really frustrating to not be able to like cleaning our house like robert's so bad he's like a really unorganized person not that i'm like super organized but if i need to go and decide our house is not clean enough i'll like just go crazy and put everything in place and i'll even still do that now with in the wheelchair like if you see me you'll be like oh my god like i'm like bending down and grabbing in pain and be like ah, ah but I have to organize it. It's like <laughs> frustrating because, you know, as Paul said, we're getting older, you know, I'm not going to be able to, you know, I'm going to hurt myself doing things like that because I'm older and I might tweak my back doing that. I don't want to do that either. So, you know, so now I think a little bit more about when I'm like, when I was 29, I was all like, get out of my way I'm doing this but now I'm kind of like oh maybe I shouldn't do that because I could hurt myself and then I you know be more messed up than I am now so and Jessica you're not responsible for their feelings like if they're willing to take you on like date you and take you on it's like if they feel the pressure that's like not your responsibility that's 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 something that they have to deal with too um but those are things that can be talked about. I feel like, I feel like the disability is a filter for dating. Like what Priya was saying earlier about how it kind of drops all of the superficiality and the niceties. Like my husband and I, when we first went on our first trip together, like traveling getaway for Memorial day weekend, how romantic, right? Take a drive around the coast of, of, uh, the California of California and, and you know, whatever, wherever the wind blows. And then it's like, okay, well, can you help me 
uh, I need to go to the bathroom or wait, I really want to dress up in this lingerie, but you have to dress me in it first. You know, <laughs> like, <laughs> and, you and that it. completely defeats the purpose of it, really, yeah, when you think exactly. about it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> the woman puts on the laundry, comes out all surprised. It's right? Sexy. None of that. None of that. On me. <laughs> right. I know. I'm like, I have a surprise for you, but you're going to have to put it on me first. Like, it's just, it loses its steam. Um, so, I roll. <laughs> thought for me like the way the Robert and I met before I was disabled and the way our relationship flowed I think for me a lot of it had to do with more cultural differences than ability differences because you know coming from this Indian family we're dating and then I saw my parents even though they did have crushes on each other in college but it was like like my mom's cousin had to go to my grandmother and be like oh this girl this girl she's really beautiful and she graduated in this college and then my grandmother's like okay we're gonna arrange the marriage between my dad and my mom so that's like how things worked out so like this like american version of what how relationships are created and dating that was just not present in my life so i think because of that I was more drawn to the way a person was than I don't know what other people think of they're trying to go into relate you know like I don't I don't know I don't even know what that mindset is like of what a no regular American teenager that's born and raised in America like and raised with this family structure that's like you date and then you married and maybe you'll get divorced or <laughs> I don't know so like things like divorce is always like I, I have to tell you so i'm like i'm trying to work on this documentary about the diversity of uh uh, uh ability within disabilities and i've known i just started talking to john and tylea like recording them and like conversations and they just started talking about their dating thing and i was like okay we're gonna we're gonna do something about you guys and um yeah, they literally, this conversation went from like, oh, when we met, this happened, and then we're going to get married, and I'm going to wear this white dress, and this is what we're going to name our kids, but if, if we, when we get, if we get divorced, I'm getting the kids, and I'm going to wear all <laughs> from, oh, we get together, and this is what I'm going to wear at my wedding, and these are the kids. It's better, but if you get divorced, I'm getting a good lawyer, so you better know I'm keeping the kids. And I just was like laughing. I was like, okay, you guys, this conversation literally like within 10 minutes went from, oh, gushy, gushy, love, getting married, happiness, to like, what's going to happen during the divorce? <laughs> I think it's really part of the American culture is like, divorce is a whereas in Indian culture it's like no you know unless it's like something really like a man is really abused I, I had an aunt who, whose husband was like physically abusive to her like where she almost died so she did get a divorce but it came with all these social things and that which happens with disability as well I think well, and I wonder if that adds to our insecurity as people with disabilities, right? Like, oh, I can be tossed away at any time. Or yeah. it's like this, like relationships are temporary. There's no like, we're like Tylea and John's like, we're our ride or die. And, and, but then they talk about divorce in the next, you know, <laughs> so. And John, never divorce you, Tylea. I'll die before I divorce you. And I was like, well, then she'd be a widow, John. She wouldn't, you wouldn't be a divorce. <laughs> Way to be a smart ass, Priya. <laughs> <laughs> <The widow's laughs> but yeah, we're just kind of joking about the divorce, obviously. But I just think it was funny that it was a conversation, you know, like in Indian things, like the divorce is like, it's not even like something you can imagine would happen. My brother did get divorced and it was like a real struggle. Like my parents were calling me secretly and it was just like a real struggle for my parents when this happened with my brother. And, you know, so it, you know, so it's, it's just, 
a thing that we just don't really think about. Yeah. Right. From get -go. And yeah, as a disabled, in an American culture with a disability, you meet someone, you like them. And then, yeah, in the back of your head is like, if I'm too much of a burden, are they going to leave me? Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, so that, you know. Well, and I think that that could be a whole other topic is how do we, like, for those people that are in relationships, how do we um, maintain our own individuality and confidence and know our value in the relationship, understanding that it's not always about what's equal or like, like Priya, you may be able to relate. I, you know, my husband does a lot more of the stuff. He'll do the cooking. He does the laundry. He does the cleaning. He does everything. Um, <laughs> thanks, Paul. Paul says, so what you're saying is I've saved myself a lot of trouble by not dating. <laughs> uh, yes, you have. You've avoided a big, you've avoided a big speed bump of life. And let me tell you, the relationships are one of the hardest things you will ever do. If you are truly committed in a relationship, oh my gosh, it is so it's hard. Sometimes I'm like, God, God. Why am I in a relationship? It's so hard. Right, exactly. It's like, can't we go back to the honeymoon stage? Just, just. What about giving birth? Giving, giving birth, giving birth, I've <laughs> that, but Pauline has given birth, so I don't know. What do you want to do? What do you want to know specifically? I'm just kidding. Oh, oh you're kidding. kidding. Well, you said relationships were hard, well. What about giving birth? Isn't that tough? <laughs> Not as hard as relationships. I mean, I don't have a reference. Well, I don't have a reference because I've never been married and I don't have a kid. But so I yeah. can well, I can tell you, being in a marriage and giving birth, giving birth was easier. It is. It, it definitely relationships are not oh, really? part. Yeah. I mean, it's great. I love my husband and, and we have a good time and he makes me laugh and he, all the needs are taken care of. Um, but then there are times you just like, I love you and hate you all at the same time. And how do I <laughs> not yeah. kill you right now? <laughs> I sometimes like, God, I really hate you right now, Robert. You're really irritating me. Right. Right. Robert I, he doesn't say things like that to me, but I do to him. <laughs> I do to him. Women are brutal. Uh, that, that like reminds me of my favorite line where I'm just like, I love you, but I, that doesn't mean I have to like you right now. <laughs> yes. Like, yeah, that's freaking like, hate your guts right now. That's, that's Give me a day or two and I'll be fine. Right. That's what being in a long-term relationship is really like. It's like, I really do love you, but I just don't want to. I mean, I actually like it when Robert. Uh, I don't personally do what I need to do because I feel like he gets in my way sometimes. I'm like, can you just go do something else? I'm really busy. I'm, I'm busy writing about disability. <laughs> Leave me alone. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are almost up at time. Um, I, you know, I feel like this is a conversation that we could have so long. Oh, no. Uh, because, okay. Let's but, move on. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. Whatever you guys want to do is fine with me. <laughs> well, we're not, I mean, we are, we're going to probably call it because it is 1230 and my, my son is dying for the ethernet for his Minecraft. So, <laughs> <laughs> FYI, you're if you have to navigate. Exactly. Funny. I was going to say, FYI, the hardships of relationships and marriage is the same for kids. It's like, <laughs> oh, giving birth to you is the easiest part. <laughs> yeah. And um, Pauline, I was thinking about future subjects. I'd really like to talk about, you know, ableism that we've experience with the medical industry like doctors and how they oh, that's a good topic yeah yeah when they can't come up with the cure for you or whatever and then Ilya and i were actually talking maybe 
a couple of us people could do this like but representation of disability in media yeah so um <clears throat> we're gonna do that about next week Paul talked about that movie come as you are which i saw was a really great movie <clears throat> the problem with the disability community which i actually don't agree I understand giving disabled actors gigs and jobs in movies that are about disabled people, but this movie was so good. I actually had to look up to see if these three guys were disabled in the movie because they were really good actors and obviously did their research and did a really good job at yeah. addressing. Yeah. Don't you, Paul? Yes. Yeah. So, Come As You Are is a, a movie with disabled characters but that were they were the actors disabled no they weren't i looked it up later i was like god these guys did a good job are they disabled and they're not disabled people are going to be mad about that but i wasn't because i talked to ty tylee and i am talking about that it's like is as long as the media is representing disability in a correct way yeah me yeah. actors disabled or not disabled isn't as important now i do understand people's you know like disabled people should get but you know it's like what if they're a bad disabled uh, <laughs> they're not gonna act as well as the non-disabled person so, you know, like that kind of thing. well it's interesting i i just gotta see your hand up um uh, i actually this week will be coming out with um i did an interview with keely catwells who has a um, who's a disabled actress? She has C Talent Agency, which is an agency for disabled uh, and multi diverse people um, for in the Hollywood industry. And she has she's from the UK, so she has this beautiful like British accent, and everything they say sounds amazing and sophisticated. Um, and so and she has, so she has Zetter Studios there, which is a studio that will be. Um, all ac accessible so you know producers can use it that studio for you know movies I, hey i wanted to be an extra to make some money and they they charge you 20 bucks to you know get applied to it and they're like we're not going to charge you the 20 bucks because you're not going to get any jobs because the sets are completely inaccessible and i was like well and that's the thing she was saying is that um, the whole industry in behind the scenes is so inaccessible that even and, if there were people with disabilities who were actors and were good, could not get to the to the um, auditions. All things all over them, so wheelchairs can't actually go over them and stuff like that. You know. Yeah. So, so it's yeah, a problem. it's Very a problem, and I, I actually am on the side of um, not wanting non-disabled people to play disabled actors because if you apply that to like black people or latinos or you know i think they would have a problem with a white guy painting their face playing a black guy or, yeah no i understand that and but i you think it's really frowned upon because um megan kelly you know that talk show host um she got she got fired for um like saying blackface, she just mentioned it and she got fired. But it's crazy how political correct correctness um, plays a part in, you know, society. Mm -hmm. But no, I understand what you're saying. Like, yeah, if a man, a woman, and, and the LGBTQ community kind of struggles with that too because you could get a straight person to play a person that's LGBTQ and the same. So there's a lot of similarities between yeah. those two communities, in my opinion, except we don't have the right to get married. Yeah. So that'll be a whole other topic. Um, Jessica, I know you had something to say. And I'm all for like having diverse approaches. Like, I'm like, if you feel like, people it doesn't matter who the actor is if they're disabled or not i'm i'm all for like i'm glad because there needs to be that voice too it's not about like convincing it's about just allowing the different opinions to well, until the industry makes things accessible like like the movie come as you are they probably couldn't have made that movie with you know because i'm sure it was shot in la and it was probably inaccessible to right. shoot it 
Right. So and then that's so what, but if the industry starts working towards accessibility, then disabled actors could actually get these roles. And well, they're like on trips with three wheelchairs and a van and a anyone, we all know. We all know we can only fit one wheelchair in a van. So <laughs> well and I feel that but, but one, I think one. 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 one wheel. One wheelchair and a I, van. And I feel like though if we don't start making noise, they all have no incentive of making things accessible behind the scenes. I agree. I've come as you are is really those those actors weren't to say they did an excellent job. I am gonna watch that. I'm excited too. All right, Jessica, thank you for again for your patience. I'm sorry, Jessica, I talk a lot, you know. All right, go yeah, ahead. Yeah, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I just kind of wanted to add to like what, what Priya said about, you know, non-disabled actors, you know, playing disabled characters. I mean, I see both sides of the argument. Um, and it, it, that just reminds me of, um, the movies. I don't know if you guys have heard of it. Um, but it's called Skyscraper with, um, Dwayne Johnson and he played, um, a baloney amputee. And I have the utmost respect for that man because I mean he didn't just wing it because he didn't know anything about it I mean he he did his research he met with um he actually met with veterans who were baloney amputees because he played a, a veteran who is um a baloney amputee and it just it blew my mind that I mean he portrayed it so well and um so I mean as, as long as these people, you know, do their homework, research, you know, even try to live their life in a wheelchair just to like really understand what that feels like, um, you know, I, I, th I think that we should give them a chance. Um, but yeah, it would be really cool to see more people that are actually, that actually have a physical disability like that in movies and um, like TV shows and what have you. Um, and yeah, I, th I think more people need to speak out about that. Um, I just, I, I, re I remember when that movie f was first coming out and it was this was after I lost my leg and I was just in awe of that. Cause I'm like, you don't see people playing baloney amputees, you know? So I'm just like, okay, I I'm wondering how the hell is he going to pull this off? Like, this should be really interesting. And, you know, I, I watched all the, like, behind the scenes kind of stuff, like the things that he did and people he talked to and things like that. And I was just like, wow, like, this guy actually gives a damn. And ever since then, like, I've followed Dwayne Johnson and I value the things that he speaks out about. And um, he's just, he's a truly remarkable person. I mean, be, he's, but he's still a human being, and I think a lot of people forget that. You know, and people in Hollywood, they're still people. They're still human beings. On the opposite end of that, I did attend the Real Abilities Film Festival at the beginning of this year or something, and uh, I saw an interview with John Kur Kurzinski. He did The Quiet Place, that movie, The Quiet Place, that he directed, and the girl, oh, yeah. the girl that plays the character is actually a she's deaf and he talked about like how it was great to have her because he actually informed her like he he helped her direct it better because he you know i saw the movie i actually watched the movie because after that interview and i was just like oh yeah because there's scenes in there where she probably was like oh yeah in this scene since a deaf person wouldn't know this was happening you know he consultant she was the consultant essentially because she's deaf so i i do see the value of having you know if they, you got an actual below level amputee to play it then they wouldn't really have to research <laughs> they wouldn't have to research it they just know and do it but you know it's really i don't know i just think just that take the effort to actually research understand what that lifestyle is like is also good in my opinion yeah. But I'm for disabled people getting as many jobs as they can <laughs> in the end. <laughs> but yeah. if someone makes it, they're non-disabled, good for them. And my Maya Saud, who's a cerebral palsy 
uh, comedian. She, I, she actually talked at the Crip Camp virtual thing. She did the first one. And she was like saying her problem was the only people that got disabled were, old were white men. What? <laughs> She's like, white men get all the disabled roles. They never give like a woman of color uh, a role as a disabled person. I was like, that's true. Yeah, it that is true. Looking back, oh, I think white men get it all. I guess. <laughs> well, The Rock is not white, so. Yes. Um, I was just going to say, he's rock. the exception. He is not a white man. <laughs> well, he's The Rock. He's The Rock, you know? He's yeah. like, you know top of the echelon of colored people so good for him you know? yeah yeah but I love the okay. rock. stop talking now and <laughs> we will we just blend it into the next week's conversation which i'm so excited about because obviously we have a lot to say about it so um i'm looking forward to next week so it'll be about disability in the media um and talia asked if she could um help host that but yeah that would that would be awesome and then Priya, if you would like to do um, ableism in the medical industry the following week, I mean, that would be totally cool too. Um, okay. Yeah. And then um, I will give some thought as to which, you know, recording, not recording, because I see the value in, in what we're doing as well and, and putting it out there. Um, and, and, uh, I, I, and at the same time, I also want to make sure people feel safe to be able to express themselves. So, um, yeah. I just felt conversation, just even though some other people felt uncomfortable to be part of it, I think there's so much valuable information that came out of this conversation that yeah. people. Yeah. That people so, um, Pauline. Yeah, Denise. You actually just put it on Crypto the crib chat site or do you put it on um one like youtube on the one leg up productions youtube, YouTube yeah oh youtube okay yeah. hmm. i watch all the episodes i'm i'm a went yeah. watcher of the one leg up Productions. yay <laughs> my first loyal <laughs> customer thank That's you the one with the accessories um i love that I love those people. Like, I want to contact them. Like, I love you people. And uh, which one? Know, the accessible stall. Oh, right. Emily Ladau and Kyle Katadorian. They're amazing. You should listen to their podcast. So good. I, I loved that interview. And then I, I was starting to watch the one on the technology, but I, I didn't. Yeah. I'm going to watch. That, that one's a little oh. drier. Yeah, yeah, I was just starting to watch it and then Robert started talking. I was like, well, no, I can't watch this interview, Robert. All right. So, um, sneak peek, we have Keely Catwells on um, disability in the entertainment industry coming up. And we also have Jessica Cox, the armless pilot. Um, mm -hmm. Whitney Bailey, who has a podcast called Spastic Chatter. So, she's CP. Um, and we have um, Misa on Wheels, which talks about cosplay, disability in the cosplay world. So I don't know if any of you are familiar. Do you after this meeting for a second? I just want to ask you something real quick. About absolutely. Absolutely. All right. All so right. we're going to stop recording and um, I will see you guys next week. Same bat time, same bat place. Um, thank you all so much for, for being so good about sharing so transparently and, and, and vulnerably. So, and being allowed to be, to uh, share that with the world. So thank you guys. I love you.